All right, should we give it a minute or so? Although, how's this um, number com compared to what we have signed up, Pam? Uh, we're still waiting on a few people. Tra traffic's, ba traffic's bad because of the snow. <laughs> really, really bad driving. I understand. I know it took me a while to get from that room into here. <laughs> so, yeah. I thought the parking was worse. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, well, no reason to just sit here. So um, welcome everybody. It's great to see everybody. Um, again, though, it's a shame that we're here, but at least we're able to gather um, and hopefully we'll just, you know, keep things moving along as always and should be done in an hour. But um, we obviously wanted to get through some Things and introduce you to um, some someone new, and um, let's just do what we always do and um, just begin by going around. Um, I think the easiest way is if I just call on people in order of where I see it on here. Um, so again, I'm Pat Rind. Um, I'm a member of the advisory board. Um, I'm also um, a member of Com Community Synagogue of Rye, um, and my pronouns are she and her. Um, so, uh, Pam, since you're next, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Pam Goldstein from the Westchester Jewish Council. My pronouns are she and her. Uh, thank you so much for joining us um, tonight. We're really thrilled to have all of you and you know, the work is so important. So thank you for all that you're doing. Abby. Hi, Abby Reichen from um, Bet Am Shalom Synagogue and the uh, Mosaic Advisory Council. Um, sorry, it's jumping around. Mark. Hi, I'm Mark Klee. I'm a past president of Bethel in New Rochelle. I'm also treasurer of the Westchester Jewish Council, he and him. Diane. I'm Diane Werner, a member of the advisory board, uh, Hebrew Institute of White Plains, and my pronouns are she and her. Jill. Hi, Jill Schreibman. I'm a member of the uh, advisory board. I'm a social worker at Westchester Jewish Community Services, and my pronouns are she, her. Thank you. Harriet. I'm Harriet Lean. I'm a member of Woodlands Community Temple. My pronouns are she and her. Uh, and I think I may have missed another question because I just came on. Did I miss something? Nope, that was fine. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks, You're Harriet. You're welcome. Lori, go. Hi, hi I'm she and her, and I'm the rabbi at uh, Temple Bethel in Danbury. We were pushing it. We used to be in Putnam County and Brewster, and we affiliated with uh, Westchester, but I'm glad that I'm still able to participate in this wonderful group. It's always nice to see everybody. Absolutely. Welcome. Thanks. Um, rabbi Goldberg. Hi, I'm uh, Rabbi Ben Goldberg. I'm the rabbi of Congregation KTI in Portchester, New York. Thank you. Um, Anna. Hi, I'm Anna Turkenitz. I am, uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I am the education director at the Pelham Jewish Center. Thank you. Um, Barack Stockler. I hope I didn't mangle that. That was fine. Um, hi, I'm Barack Stockler. He, him, his. I'm the director of youth engagement and congregation Kolami in White Plains. Thanks. Um, Ari. Hi, Ari Fernandez. Uh, they, them, theirs at um, Hillel's of Westchester as their Jewish life coordinator. Thank you. Oh, this is jumping all around. Corey. Hi, Corey Friedlander from Woodlands Community Temple and uh, he and him. Okay. Um, Chris Aldi, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself now, and then we'll learn more about what 
you're doing. Sure. Hi, everyone. Hi. Chris Oldy. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm here as the chair of the LGBTQ advisory board um, to the county executive, but also I'm here to talk about a little bit about my work um, as an attorney with legal services of the Hudson Valley, if you don't mind. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, great. No, we don't mind that at all. Um, David Diamond. Hi, I'm David Diamond. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm with uh, Central Lane, the WJCS program for LGBTQ plus youth in Westchester County. Great, thank you. Um, Ellen Newmark. Ellen, are you there? All right, it's like when my students walk away. Well, I Ellen. started on my phone because my computer wouldn't start, so. Okay. Ellen Feld Newmark, congregant at Congregation KTI in Port Chester, New York, and I go by she and her. Thank you. Ethan. Ethan Felsen. My pronouns are he and him. I'm the executive director of A Wider Bridge, which works for equality for Israel, equality in Israel, and justice for everyone. And I hope to be a resident of Westchester County post-COVID. Great. Thank you. Uh, Gigi. Uh, I'm Gigi. Um, and I use she, her, her, she, oh, sorry, she, her, hers pronouns and um, I'm with Woodlands Community Temple. Thank you. Uh, Jill Friedman. Hi, I'm Jill Friedman. I'm the Associate Regional Director for AJC um, American Jewish Committee, Westchester Fairfield. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm actually looking forward to, I'm happy to be invited to um, participate in this and learn a little bit more about your work and how we can work together. Wonderful, thank you. Joel. Hi everyone, I'm Joel Davidson. I'm on the Mosaic Advisory Board and I'm a Dean at uh, the LaFell School and my pronouns are he, him, his. Judy. Fensterman. Hi, I'm a, a member of Temple Sheree Tefila in um, Bedford. Um, pronouns are she, her, hers, and um, I am co-chair of the LGBTQ Inclusion Committee. Thank you. Liz. Liz Raleigh, I use she, her, hers. I'm a member of Community Synagogue of Rye. Thank you. Um, Michelle Steinhardt. Hi, Michelle Steinhardt. She, her, hers. I'm the director of inclusion at Temple Israel Center in White Plains. Thank you. Uh, Nate. Hey, all. I'm Nate Shalev. I'm the senior director of programs and strategy at A Wider Bridge, working with Ethan, uh, and pronouns are they and them. Thank you. Rachel Klein. Hi, I'm Rachel Klein. I'm the executive director of Hillel's of Westchester and a member of the Mosaic Advisory Committee. Her um, Rebecca Ruberg. Hi, my name's Rebecca Ruberg. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm one of the teen engagement and education consultants for the Jewish Education Project. Thank you. Sarah Duff, is that right? I will say that Sarah Beth, my colleague, is here, but um, also has a young baby at home who is off screen. And so at times is pulled away from her computer. Um, and this may be one of those times um, she Oh, yeah, she wrote that, actually. Exactly. In the and she chat. also wrote her, her title and kind of what brings her, or maybe she didn't, but um, I'm sure we'll be happy to tell you about her work. Thank you. Yeah, we all understand. Um, did I say Sarah Feinstein, I don't believe I did. Uh, Sarah Feinstein, I'm a member of Scarsdale Synagogue and she, her. Thank you. Sharon. Hi, Sharon Gorman, a member of Temple Israel of New Rochelle. Um, I use she, her, hers pronouns. Thank you, everybody. Did I leave anybody out? Not that I can see you all, yeah, but I if I did, unmute. You did, yeah, Pat, Miriam. Uh, Rabner. Okay. Miriam. Thanks, Joe. Uh, 
And here I thought I could get away with being. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Miriam Rabner. I'm uh, the cultural um, sensitive liaison at MJHS Hospice and Palliative Care and an outreach coordinator. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Thank you. Anyone else I left out? It's hard to keep track. All right, um, then I welcome all of you again. Thank you for that. It's always good to hear where everybody's from and what they're doing and who's new. So that's really neat. Thank you. Um, so we are um, very fortunate um, to have uh, Rabbi Ben Goldberg here from KTI in Port Chester. Um, and I will say that he um, spoke at our Pride Shabbat last year and was awesome. So I just wanted to add that in. Um, and he will do a divorce Torah for us. So I'm um, it over to you, Rabbi. Thank Goldberg. you. Thanks. <clears throat> Um, thank you. I neglected to say my pronouns earlier, but they are he, him. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, so I was asked to speak a little bit about Purim uh, from a LGBT slash queer, whatever term you want to use, um, perspective. Um, and I think what's interesting about this is the opportunity to read familiar material through a new lens. I think all of us as inheritors of any religious or cultural tradition um, right, we the way we inherit that is colored by our own social position, by our own life experiences, um, and that's true. I think for um, members of the LGBTQ um, plus community, um, uh, myself included, um, and uh, so it's an interesting opportunity. I think to um, to sort of step away from uh, sort of a a defensive argument about like, is this okay or not? And like arguing about like who can be included and who can't, um, you know, it, uh, stepping towards like a new uh, way of, of um, to a new discussion about uh, well, what is what does it actually enable us to see that we didn't see before um, by having um, people with various gender and sexual identities sort of included um, in the community. Uh, so sort of moving to that conversation as opposed to having conversation about who's allowed to be at the table. Um, uh, which is really um, uh, um, been been the main topic of conversation in religious communities for a very long time, but trying to move away towards the well, what is what do we actually what can we see that we couldn't see before now that that um, at least some you know there's a, there's a more diversity uh, anyway than there used to be of um, in terms of gender and, and sexual um, sexuality. Um, so just want to look at what I assume will be familiar to most of you, which is the, the porn story, um, but to try to read it as a um, as a coming out narrative, right? So this is a, a story, a text, the you know the scroll of Esther, uh, which on its face isn't really about gender or sexuality at all, um, but nonetheless, right? There are aspects of this that resonate, I think, with a lot of um, people's experiences in the LGBT um, plus community. Um, and I've presented this material a couple of times before, including at a session where, uh, David Diamond, who was here, was at, um, and I recall David that you had very insightful things to say about it. Um, but it was more than six months ago and I couldn't quite remember exactly what those insightful things were. Um, but hopefully, uh, if you have anything you want to add, um, you're welcome to. Um, so again, so just to, to go through, you know, some, you know, pieces of the story, right, trying to read, um, the story of Esther as a coming out narrative. Um, right, so uh, at the beginning, right, Esther is, um, you know, wins the contest to be, become the wife of, next wife of King Ahasuerus, and the Megillah tells us that Esther did not reveal her kindred or her people, as Mordecai instructed her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai's bidding as she had done when he was, she was under his tutelage. Um, so Esther's in hiding at the beginning of the story. She's in hiding about some aspect of her true identity uh, for good reason. Um, she has good reason. Uh, I believe, David, this is this was your point at, at, at that session, but correct me if I'm wrong. Um, she has good reason to to not come out, as it were, as, about her status as a Jew, right? It could possibly endanger her life. Um, she has no support structures in place. Um, she's told, you know, everyone she trusts has told her not to. Um, and so she begins the story in hiding, and we see that she's very passive in this part of the story, right? She, there's all these passive verbs that are used to describe her actions, right? She's at the whim of other people's, um, other people's control. Her, her cousin Mordechai 
um, you know, the king, various other officials in the court. So she's in hiding. Uh, and then, you know, as the story unfolds, um, when Mordechai uh, implores Esther to intervene with the king, which she hesitates to do um, because, without invitation because doing so risks her life. And she finally agrees when Mordecai points out how she is in fact uniquely positioned to help, right? There's the famous phrase, um, you know, perhaps it was for this very moment that you achieved your royal position. So finally, Esther then writes back to Mordecai and she says, okay, go assemble all the Jews who live in Shushan and fast on my behalf. Um, and I and my maidens will observe the same fast and then I will go to the king, even though it's contrary to the law. And if I'm to perish, I will perish. Um, so Esther sort of assembles her allies. Well, first of all, first of all, she realizes that there's that um, there's something that she needs to bring to the table, like I was saying earlier, right? There's something that she's uniquely positioned to do that, that her community, the, the Jews of Shushan um, and Shushan overall will be worse off without what she's able to bring uniquely as herself. Um, and she realizes this. And so, but she realizes she can't just do it, right? So she assembles some allies where she has all the other Jews and her own, you know, um, you know women who are with her uh, fasting uh, together sort of in spiritual preparation for this, this uh, task that she has undertaken. And she realizes there's just some real risk here. And she says, you know what, if, I'm, if, if I die doing this, then so be it, right? So she, she's taking a real risk. Um, we know it all sort of works out for her in the end, but, but she doesn't know that at this point in the story. Um, so there's fear, there's risk, um, and nonetheless a decision, I need to come forward as, as who I am um, for the sake of myself and for the sake of, of my community and for the sake of, of justice. So she does that, right? And there's the climactic showdown in chapter seven, um, where uh, she sort of comes out in a way to the king, right, as a Jew, but she never, she doesn't actually say, um, uh, I am Jewish, at least at this point, right? She just says, my people, without specifying who they are, um, right, are about to be destroyed and massacred and exterminated, right, um, because of this evil Haman. Um, so if you read it closely, right, you know, it's sort of a coming out moment, but nonetheless, it's a, it's a step out of the closet, as it were, um, but only a step, um, right? She still has to sort of circumlocute um, <laughs> and without saying outright exactly who, um, uh, who she, um, who exactly she is um, in so many words. Uh, and then finally, she does do that in chapter eight. Um, uh, where she introduces Mordechai again, like using her relationship with another person um, as a way of subtly, you know, disclosing something about her own identity, which is something I think a lot of, um, of queer people do. Um, uh, and then she says, um, you know, finally she says, uh, right, how can I bear to see the disaster which will befall my people and how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? Um, Again, not exactly identifying in so many words, but nonetheless making it clear that she's a part of this group that Haman had, had targeted. Um, so we're coming out as a process. It's not just a moment where you know everything changes, but nonetheless, it's a process. And I think that certainly resonates with my experience um, and with the experience of, of a lot of, of people. Um, so we could go into much greater depth about that. Um, but nonetheless, I just think it's, it's interesting to know that here, right, right in our own uh, scriptures and in you know, a holiday that in a story that we teach to little children, we have a coming out narrative right at the heart of Jewish tradition. Um, it's not about gender or sexuality necessarily, um, but nonetheless, it, it's uh, something that we can that when we bring that contemporary experience um, to our reading of it, it pops out very clearly. Oh, this is a coming out story. Um, and it's a story about bravery and about and risk um, and all of the various steps of that process. Um, of, you know, internalizing your own identity and then being able to share that with other people. Um, so I think that's, that's, I think what there's all this work of inclusion that, that all the people on this call are involved in in various ways um, ultimately accomplishes is, is um, being able to see those, uh, those narratives that are already there in our own tradition um, and to help um, sort of live them out in the most, most full, uh, full way. Um, so thank you all that, and I'll wish you a happy forum. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. And, Go ahead, Mark. Uh, uh, appreciate those uh, wise comments, and Hak Sameach to you in advance. I have the great honor of introducing uh, Chris Oldie. Um, the advisory board was originally established, and this is the LGBTQ advisory board, it was established in Westchester County back in 2002, but wasn't formally in the charter, meaning that previously it had served at the whim of the county executive. This past November, 
Westchester County Executive George Latimer took action to make it more formal and continuing. And it would be my pleasure to introduce um, the chair of the advisory board, Chris Oldie, who, as I'm about to tell you, has one impressive resume. The function of the board is to advise the county executive on issues important to the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community. Recommendations from the board may be in the areas of legislation, services, programs, funding, or anything else the advisors deem appropriate. Christopher joined the board in 2013, and he's been chairing the board since 2015. Chris's day job is as a public interest attorney. Currently, he's the pro bono director at legal services of the Hudson Valley, where he oversees the implementation and development of pro bono programming in the agency. Prior to becoming the pro bono director, Chris was a supervising attorney in the Yonkers office, supervising staff attorneys and support staff. He also spearheaded and served as the staff attorney of the legal services of Hudson Valley's LGBTQ legal project from 2015 to 2016, where he represented low income LGBTQ individuals in the Hudson Valley in areas such as discrimination, name changes, landlord tenant matters, disability advocacy, and other civil legal services. Prior to joining legal services in 2014, Chris was an associate with the law firm of Wormser, Keeley, Galef, and Jacobs LLP, where he specialized in municipal law. He's a graduate of Vassar College, where he received a BA with honors in psychology and Italian, and then went on to earn his Juris Doctorate at CUNY School of Law at Queens College. He's the chair of the Westchester County LGBTQ Advisory Board, as I noted, and he's also on the Family and Matrimonial Committee of the LGBT Bar Association of Greater New York, as well as a member of the New York State Bar Association. Because of his community work throughout the county, the Westchester County Legislature has named two Chris Oldie days in his honor, one in June of 2016 and one in September of 2017. Now that is impressive. <laughs> so before Chris speaks, let me just remind you, please put questions uh, in the chat box as you think of things as Chris is speaking. I'll moderate a Q&A session immediately after his remarks. With that, Chris, take it away. Thank you so much, Mark, and thank you to Mosaic and the Westchester Jewish Council for inviting me um, to speak um, about the work of the advisory board. And if I could talk a little bit about the work that I do as my day job, I think it would be helpful for you to uh, know about some of the services that my agency also provides. So we are very excited that the advisory board is now, you know, officially legislatively you know, part of the culture and the fabric of Westchester County. Since 2002, as Mark, as Mark had mentioned, we were really an, an ad hoc committee. And what that did was it really was at the whim of the county executive that was the county executive at the time. And not to be political about it, but, you know, during my first number of years on the board with, um, you know, Rob Astorino, we still were a board. We still existed. We were not taken away whatsoever. And Rob was present in terms of being a ear to us. However, I will say that this new administration has taken a just a more fully realized stance on issues surrounding LGBTQ plus individuals in Westchester County, such that we have been able to do, I think, a little bit more in this legis in this administration. Um, but thankfully, the prior administration still allowed us to exist. We still met as, a, as, a, as an advisory board. Um, and I think that we're just happy that we can now really push our uh, agenda setting a little bit more fully realized as we you know, are working with this current legislation. Um, but I just want to talk about some of the past things that the advisory board has helped with, um, some of the things that we've recently done, some of the things that we're hoping to do um, to possibly spur some conversation. Again, we are an advisory board. So we are tasked with being an advisor to the county executive. Something that happens as the advisory board, we are an advisory board of a lot of interesting individuals. We have attorneys on our board, business and business 
business people, uh, educators, students um, who come up with really interesting and creative ideas of how to uh, effectively ensure that resident, the LGBTQ residents of Westchester County are respected and have full, full rights, et cetera. Um, but we, our main focus and our main purpose is to advise the county executive. Um, however, we as a board sometimes try and get into more of an advocacy role um, within the community because we are such a diverse group of individuals. Um, as, as Mark said, the board has been around since 2002. Um, and you know, one of the things that I know that the board did back in the day before uh, New York and the federal government passed same-sex marriage was to work on Westchester County had a domestic partnership registry um, that you could with your domestic partner be able to sign a domestic you know, registry form and file it with the county executive, excuse me, the county clerk in Westchester County. And I know that at the time, uh, again, before, you know, gay marriage was even a thought process really, um, you know, the county had been respecting, respecting the domestic partner registry. That was before my time on the board, but I know that that was part of, um, you know, the, the past history. And then, you know, we have many members of our um, board, like for example, um, Mike, Sabatino, who was a city councilman in Yonkers, um, was very, uh, very front and center in the fight for um, gay marriage in New York State and, and federally. So we have a history there of recognizing and respecting um, couples uh, in, in Westchester County. Um, something that the board has always been part of, and it's gone through different stages in terms of uh, the, the who was on our board, the, the advisory board members, but there was a long period of time where we had an educator on our board who would train county police officers um, on cultural sensitivity as it pertains to LGBTQ individuals. Um, that individual went off the board, so we haven't been part of the training, but just recently we have now we as a board want to get more into um, what is happening in training, what is ha happening in our police force as, as it pertains to cultural sensitivity um, for LGBTQ individuals and what are they doing to make sure that our police force is, is effectively being trained um, to, you know, use compassion with, with the LGBTQ plus community. One of the members on our board um, has been part of a, a group um, that, that the county executive created uh, a police reform task force. Um, so we're really happy that we have someone from our advisory board um, who identifies as trans to be part of the task force as it pertains to ensuring that, um, you know, the, the police, uh, that there are some police reforms as it pertains to um, racial inequities in Westchester. Um, some other things that we're that I'm really excited about in terms of uh, we as a board taking the lead on legislation, which is one of our edicts in terms of advising the county executive on legislation that will be helpful um, and, and respectful for L the LGBTQ community in Westchester. Um, we were in 2018, the board was instrumental in the um, passage of a bill that uh, banned conversion therapy for minors in Westchester County. Um, New York State subsequently passed a bill that banned that, but Westchester was before the state. There had been a number of counties throughout the, the state that had been passing um, the conversion the the conversion the conversion therapy legislation banning it for minors. Uh, I think we were maybe the third or the fourth county to pass it, and then about a year later, New York State full legislature passed it, um, banning it. But that was a really exciting. Uh, moment for the advisory board. Not only were we instrumental in helping to draft the legislation, but we were you know, there to talk to the legislators about why it was important. We had to testify before um, the, 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 the Board of Legislators. We had to go to the forums and to the, um, you know, public nights to, to talk about our position. I mean, thankfully it was passed and, and we had expected that it was going to be passed, but it was passed unanimously by the Board of Legislators because obviously conversion therapy to those who don't know is just an, an, an awful, um, you know, awful concept um, that was, you know, we didn't have the statistics in terms of if how, how many, you know, com conversion therapists there were out there, but even the fact that it was legal, we, needed, we knew we needed to um, get it off the, the book. So we were really happy about that. 
Uh, another thing that we were really excited about doing um, to make you know the county look and be even more visi visibly connected to the LGBTQ community. Last, this, I guess it was June of 2019, um, feels like a long time ago, pre-pandemic, um, you know, there was a large um, pride event that happened on the streets of White Plains for Westchester County. Um, and in front of the county office building, we had a um, pride flag raising ceremony. And this was the first time that the pride flag had been flown in front of the county office building. So it was flown for the whole month of June of 2019. And then it was also raised again, um, June of 2020. Um, but there was no pride event. It was a virtual pride event. But, um, you know, the county executive wanted the pride flag raised. They had never done it before. And it was a suggestion from our board to the county executive that said, June is pride, pride month. Um, we really think it's important for you to highlight it. Um, yes, you're going to put a press release out. And yes, you're going to probably put something on social media. But you know, we have a pride flag. The pride flag represents us. And we want you to Flat, you know, fly it, um, and 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 the county executive agreed, and we're happy about that, and we hope that that continues um, going going forward. Um, we also have taken a vested interest in working with the Department of Social Services as well as the Department of Corrections to review their intake documents and to review their intake procedures, and we're really thinking about our. Our, our trans youth and non-binary youth and adults um, who may be coming into these uh, departments, you know, whether it's the Department of Social Services for, um, for assistance or to the Department of Corrections for, um, some, for incarceration, that, that the intake forms are, are, are open, honest, and respectful, um, and also that they are asking the correct questions in the correct way, um, especially as it pertains to um, the Department of Corrections and in, in, in how they um, do intakes for um, trans individuals. Um, and so we are in the process of working with both of those agencies to review their intake forms, review their intake procedures from an LGBTQ lens to ensure that we believe that they are, when they are encountering anyone, um, not only does that LGBTQ plus individual feel comfortable in that agency, but the questions are being asked and then also ensuring that there's training back behind that. So that's an ongoing, um, you know, part of our role as the advisory board to see what's happening in our county offices and our county departments, um, and how can we ensure that our LGBTQ individuals are are respected. I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, we do have some open spots on the board. So for those individuals who are potentially interested in joining the board, um, you know, Mark has my contact information um, and you can certainly reach out to Mark and then he can reach out to me if, if you are interested um, in, in potentially being part of, um, part of, of the board. Um, so, so that's, I think that's all I really wanted to say about, you know, the, the advisory board. Um, I can take questions about the advisory board. I do want to just briefly talk about my agency, Legal Services of the Hudson Valley, because I would like for you all on the call to know about the services that we provide. I don't know. I don't think that there were any specific questions in the chat as it pertains to um, the advisory board. I, I have a few, but uh, please go on. I, I think that okay. the, the pro bono work you're doing there sounds so interesting. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, Mark highlighted my sort of history with the agency, but I just wanna point out that Legal Services of the Hudson Valley is a not-for-profit legal service organization that provides free civil legal services to low-income individual and families throughout the seven counties of the Hudson Valley. We have 10 different offices. We have about hundred staff attorneys and then another 30 paralegals and then another 40 um, administrative staff and intake staff. So, the, you know, the agencies, goal is to provide representation in civil legal issues where the basic necessities of life are at stake for these individuals. Um, about 48% of the work that we do is housing related, representing clients in uh, landlord tenant court. Um, right now is a really interesting, crazy time as it pertains to housing in the pandemic. There's currently a moratorium in effect that 
there's a lot of different rules and requirements that individuals um, need to put in to make sure that they're not evicted. But we are, we are, we as an agency um, are very concerned about what the status of evictions for our low income tenants and clients are going to be when we sort of come out of um, you know, the pandemic. Potentially there could be additional legislation that happens before it gets to that point, but we are very nervous about sort of the avalanche and tsunami of evictions that are going to um, you know, be confronting our clients. My work as a pro bono director, I am engaged, I am trying to engage um, volunteers, attorney volunteers um, to, to volunteer to do the work that our agency does and for our clients um, that are in need of uh, attorneys because they cannot afford them. We also have a pro bono housing project where I train along with my colleague um, and attorneys, pro bono attorneys, um, how to represent clients in landlord tenant court. So if there's any attorneys on this call, maybe you're retired, maybe you're taking a break from law, but maybe you want to get back into it. Um, if you're interested in landlord tenant, get in touch with me. But if you're interested in just learning about the agency and the kind of volunteering that you can do, give me a shout out. I'd love to talk about it. But I do want to highlight specifically, um, you know, the LGBTQ Legal Project, which was a project that I established in 2015 and is still going strong. The focus of that project is to represent clients, primarily low income, um, in issues that have a nexus to their LGBTQ status. So we represent many clients in name changes, discrimination issues, um, disability issues, anything that has a, co a connection and a nexus to their identity, their gender identity or sexual orientation. Um, and if there's a legal issue, a civil legal issue that's connected to that, you know, we want to get those clients, we want to get those referrals because we want to ensure that the community, which is a vulnerable community, especially the low income community, um, is afforded the rights and, and, and uh, the rights to have an attorney to represent them in their legal issues. Just a few other practice areas that the agency, you know, does touch on. We have a robust family law practice where we represent um, domestic violence survivors in orders of protection and custody visitation, um, disability advocacy representing clients before the Social Security Administration, public benefits ensuring that individuals are getting their SNAP benefits, their food stamps, or their cash assistance correctly. Really, any legal, civil legal issue, my agency really has the the. The, the, the desire um, to help out those clients. And especially as it pertains to sort of my baby, the LGBTQ Legal Project, we would welcome any referral that you have for a client or someone that you come in contact with um, that may have a civil legal issue that you think that we as an agency can um, assist with. Um, so I think, I think that's all I wanted to say about that. But yes, I will say the work that I do as the pro bono director, I, am atten I, I, I engage pro bono attorneys and volunteers to help try and fill the justice gap. Because despite the fact that we have 100 staff attorneys and other members and advocates in our agency, we still get calls for people that need help that we don't have the resources. There's actually, a, there's actually 500,000 individuals that qualify for legal services of the Hudson Valley within the Hudson, within our catchment area, within the seven counties. We don't serve 500,000 people a year, but we would love to, but for various reasons, not, not all those people come to us, but even if they did, we wouldn't have the resources to represent all of them, um, which is where the pro bono unit, which is where my work comes in to try and get volunteers to fill that justice gap just a little bit. And I'm trying to do that in our housing work, but also I have you know, a lot of need for other civil legal issues, including divorce, bankruptcy, consumer issues. So I'm happy to have a conversation um, offline um, with anyone that's on the call that might be interested, but I'm also happy to answer any questions that you have for me as it pertains to the advisory board um, and the county executive, or as it pertains to my day job working uh, with low income individuals in the Hudson Valley. Let me again remind you, if you have any questions, put them in the chat box and uh, we'll ask them of Chris, but I just want to ask you something about the agency there. Who is the funding source for that? Because it doesn't sound like uh, the client base that you represent is obviously uh, sufficient to uh, provide uh, ample financial resources. So we as an agency are funded from many different sources. Um, we have funding from the federal government, from Legal Services Corporation that funds part of our work. We get uh, an ample amount of funding from New York State, 
from Westchester County. We have a, you know, we have private donations. Um, but for example, like the LGBTQ Legal Project, that's money that we get from New York State that we have carved out a section of the money that we receive from New York State to specifically fund the LGBTQ Legal Project. So, you know, it's it's a conglomeration of a lot of different funding sources um, that we, you know, put all together to be able to fund our programs. Okay, we are starting to populate the chat group. Great. So let me um, ask Joel, uh, who's one of our advisory board members, asked, said, there are a number of groups that have cultural days at the uh, Kensico Dam. Uh, is there any discussion of the LGBTQ advisory board uh, creating one of these for like a pride festival? So that's a good question. And I think that in the past we have talked about sort of utilizing the Kensico Dam for a pride event. Um, the pride event, there, there's a few different pride events that happen in the Hudson Valley and in Westchester County um, in June. So Yonkers has a large pride event that they started a few years ago. Um, the Loft, which is the LGBTQ community center in, West, in White Plains, has always held a, um, a pride event. Um, and again, as I mentioned in 2019, they were able to have it on the streets of White Plains. They worked with the county executive and they also worked with the city of White Plains to create that. So I think um, that the likelihood is if we can actually have an event, I think that the city of White Plains along with the loft is likely gonna continue doing the pride event in White Plains. Plus we have the Yonkers event, plus there was an event in Peekskill and Ossining. So each different sort of area does their own pride event. Um, so to the extent that there's room for an even bigger one at the Kensico Dam, I think that would be great. I think the problem there becomes who is putting it all together because these mm -hmm. pride events take a lot of time and energy. Um, and for the advisory board, um, you know, we as a volunteer advisory board don't really have the bandwidth to um, you know, put on that event. But as someone just wrote, there's a lot of different places doing a lot of different things in June. Um, but to the extent that the different pride events would want to come together um, to do one bigger event at the, you know, the Kensico Dam, I think that's not a bad idea. But I will say that there is a lot of um, local pride in different areas. So like Yonkers, you know, there's a there's a very, there's a pretty large LGBTQ community that lives in Yonkers and wanted to put on the Yonkers Pride specifically. Same thing to, for Westchester and Peekskill and Ossining. So I think that's another way that these different communities come together so they can celebrate their own community. And I believe like Cold Spring also has a very, um, they're, that's Putnam, I think, but um, they have a very large LGBT community there. And last year, I think they were supposed to have an event and their own little Pride Parade, which I don't think happened. But so I think that each different community, when they want to celebrate their own pride, um, tries to put something together. Okay, I'm going to ask you a two part question. Uh, Rabbi asked that have you found the various county departments uh, to be receptive to your recommendations? But I want to add on to that. Can you give us an example of something that may have been controversial that maybe hasn't flown yet, but that you're, uh, you're seeing some uh, traction in that? I mean, I think all the departments have been very open to talking to us, to hearing from us, um, and open to hearing our recommendations. Um, but I will say that we provided edits to an intake document, as I'd mentioned, for the Department of Corrections. Um, and, we, and that was probably almost a year ago. And through no one's fault, I don't think we've gotten the word that they took our recommendations and it happened. So number one, things in the government tend to take a long, long time. Also, you sometimes have to be a cog in the wheel and I just haven't necessarily been that cog to make sure that they took all of our suggestions to heart and made sure that those changes were happening. So I would say to your first point and your first question, yes, very open, very receptive, wanting to talk to us. The second part of it, which is, taking our suggestions and literally our you know, handwritten suggestions of like, here's some things that you need to change, um, still waiting on some of that. Um, and I think, and I, I tend to think that that may be the case in terms of really us as an agency, I mean, as a board having to push to make sure that they're incorporating our changes and they're incorporating our ideas. But at first blush, 
anytime we have asked for a uh, someone to be invited to one of our board meetings, um, they've come. They want to come. Um, and I think it's just a matter of maybe a little more follow up either on our end or on the county executive end to make sure that our 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 um, thoughts are being implemented. Are your recommendations acted upon by uh, uh, County Exec Latimer or by the Board of Legislators or it depends what it is? I mean, you know, we've we've seen a lot of this in the past few years about executive uh, uh, orders and, and such. So I think we right. have much, much greater cognizance than we may ever have had before. So generally how it's been, you know, how it's been working is, you know, we we give our formal recommendation to the county executive who then passes that along to the agency. Um, and that's, you know, we don't, we don't, we have to go through the county executive to give him our recommendations, which have always been accepted, you know, and then it's up to them, you know, up to the county executive to sort of pass it on. We, I will say this, we work closely with, um, there is a liaison who works with the county executive. His name is Steve Bass. He sits on our board. Um, he's the person that I think introduced me to talk to all of you. Um, right, so he's the person he, I reached out to. Initially. Right, exactly. So I have a very good working relationship with Steve. We, as the board, you know, can make any recommendation that we want, but in consultation with Steve, our recommendations um, are thoughtful. And also we know that the county executive, you know, is going to be receptive to them. That's not to say that we can't pass along any recommendations to him, but working with a liaison has allowed us to pass along recommendations that we think and know will come into fruition. Okay. We don't have a lot more time, but, um... I believe you said that you do have students on the advisory board. We but have the question whether uh, yeah. they're eligible. Yep, we um, have. We currently have a senior in high school, and we would definitely welcome college students as well. Okay, is there a minimum hour commitment for pro bono work? So New York State does not have a minimum requirement, except before you can be admitted to the bar. So you pass the you pa if you pass the bar examination, you still have to be admitted because you have to you know, file out, fill out the um, application, et cetera, et cetera. You also have to show that you have volunteered before being admitted to the bar uh, 50 hours of pro bono time. But once you're in the bar, there is a recommendation that you either give your time or your money to agencies, but they have not passed any sort of rule that says in order to considered part of the bar, you have to volunteer. It's just, it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> okay, the final question that I, uh, we have time for. Um, was A few months ago, I heard a presentation from LSHV about Westchester County funding legal representation in housing court. What's the status of what uh, went on in the Westchester budget that recently passed? That's a good, that's a good question. I'm not, I'm not sure that I know the answer. I know that Westchester budget was was to include also money to assist for rental arrears. But now that there's a New York State moratorium, I think they're still waiting to see if there's gonna be additional legislation as it pertains to rental arrear issues. Um, I know, I'm, I am I believe that the, the budget has not been passed to give money to pass to us so that we could hire more attorneys. That has not happened yet to my understanding. But I also think that part of the budget issues have to deal with sort of the pandemic issues in waiting for a potential legislation to pass that might do have something to do with um, arrears assistance or rent forgiveness, something along those lines. I think everyone's in a little bit of a wait and see moment. I really appreciate your time and this is very interesting and I imagine you're going to uh, get a couple of uh, resumes out of this for the advisory board. And if there's things that we can do for you, you know, things that uh, may cross your mind, uh, we're certainly the central um, convening place within the, uh, the Jewish community of Westchester County and this committee in particular for the LGBTQ community. Um, I would ask you if you have a couple of minutes to stick around. Sure. Because, well, what you're gonna hear next, uh, I think is gonna be very interesting. I haven't heard this yet, but I know Corey is gonna to talk to us. We had planned last year to do a, 
I'm going to call it a Passover Seder, but really an educational project. And we're, uh, we obviously weren't able to do it for some strange reason. Um, and we can't do it in person again this year for that same strange reason. But um, the creativity of this group um, has worked on certain things. And I'm about to hear it as well, but I think you'll probably find it very interesting. So if you have a few more minutes, uh, please stick around. But thank you again. And let me turn it over to uh, Corey. Great. You're on mute, Corey. You're still on mute. A uh, little bit of a defective mouse click. Thank you. Uh, indeed, the uh, task force that has been working on the Seder and all those preparations has been working very creatively to try to find what we could do under these new conditions that would still put out tremendous energy and ideas to the entire community and know that we're here to support them and broaden what we can do. Uh, so the task force is Abby Reichen, Rachel Klein, Rebecca Schwartz, uh, Jordan Schwartz, her son, Anna Turkenich, her, uh, her husband, Neko. And Nico has been working with us, Joel Davidson and I. So um, we decided indeed to table that also because we want to have the full experience of the in-person um, event that we were creating next year in 2022, rather than try to do something that would be half-hearted this year. So we're looking at a date of March 27, a Sunday, sometime around 3.30 in the afternoon. Uh, we'll put this out in the minutes also, but if you can speak with your organizations and plan a save the date for March, uh, 20, uh, March 27 next year, we'll certainly be working parallel with what we're doing for this year, continuing to prepare for next year for that as well. So instead of that in-person event, we're preparing uh, some short videos, at least two to three minutes, and an accompanying wedge page of resources with the idea of using them to inspire and provide resources for people to think, discuss, and act to increase LGBTQ inclusivity and representation at their seders, and by extension, throughout their lives, and to provide a variety of ways for people to connect personally to Passover. So we're planning, uh, we will have excerpts from interviews with teens and adults in response to four questions. Of course, it's Pesach, four questions. What about the Seder plate or the Passover holiday resonates with you as a member of the LGBTQ community? Number two, what question from an LGBTQ perspective would you add onto the four questions? Three, what could you add to the Seder or to the Seder play to make it feel more LGBT inclusive? And have you seen anything added already? If so, what? And how did that resonate? And four, what is one of your favorite Seder memories? We've had a marvelous response so far to putting out the questions, uh, more than 21 different people having responded. We're in the process of selecting those to interview. It will include Nadav Shachmon, our shaliach from Israel. And we hope it will also include Rabbi Sandra Lawson, who was just appointed the inaugural director of racial diversity, equity, and inclusion for Reconstructing Judaism, the Reconstructionist Movement. Uh, Rabbi Sandra has agreed in principle, but she's in the process of preparing to leave her current position as an assistant chaplain at Elon University uh, to move into her new incredible position with reconstructing Judaism. And so she hasn't been able to set a date yet for the, uh, for the interview, but we're hoping she'll be able to do that. We also plan to create a new LGBTQ Passover resources webpage off of the LGBTQ page on the Westchester Jewish Council website. And this new webpage will include the video links, additional resources, and a PDF handout with graphics uh, that Rebecca Schwartz and her son Jordan are preparing. And Pam Goldstein, thank you. You've graciously confirmed that we can post the videos on the council's YouTube page. So in order to make all of this happen, we are incredibly lucky also that Nico Turkanich, um, Anna's husband, 
has agreed to produce our video and will be doing the interview. And he's an experienced remote video producer and director. And we are so grateful to him and to Jordan for volunteering their, their efforts for this. Our goal is to distribute everything by about March 21st with the first Seder around March 27, uh, or on March 27. Uh, the council will distribute all of this to the Mosaic Roundtable members, and, excuse me, to all of the council member organizations. And we're gonna ask all of these recipient institutions to distribute the link to their members and to post it on their social media pages. And of course, everyone who's receiving it, including the individual members, is welcomed and encouraged to post the link to their personal social media as well, because we want the word to spread as far and as wide as possible that there are ways to do this and we're here to help. Uh, the social media post will include a link to this new webpage, as well as a save the date notice for the in-person event that will be held in 2022. So we welcome a few short questions or, or comments. We've got a lot to accomplish at this meeting tonight. If there's any particularly very long response or suggestion you have, uh, we ask that you kindly email Abby after this meeting concludes. And Abby, if you could post your email address in the chat window, that way everybody will have it to respond. So thank you for all of your support and encouragement. We're very excited about this. That sounds wonderful, Corey. Thank you for that. Um, does anybody have anything that they would like to ask? If you want to just unmute and ask, I, I can't see everybody, so. All right, well, you can always, um, you know, let us know, send an email to Pam, um, and I guess Abby put her um, email address as well, so you can always um, email Abby. Abby, was there something else you wanted to put in there? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, so Rabbi Goldberg, a couple, I don't know how many years ago it was, you spoke at the Mosaic Teen Program, and uh, I'm pretty sure you brought the Rabbi Steve Greenberg article, The Perm Inside Out. And um, if you can unmute and make sure, <laughs> right? I I may have. Yes, yeah. and we I talked remember. about it. So I had kept it, and I thought it was so powerful. And I just, um, it's actually on the Keshet website. So I, um, and it refers to the the whole idea of hiding and revealing our identities with the perm story. So I just wanted to be able to share that article because I had, you know, asked Pam to reach out to you because I remember how powerful that was for our, our teens at the Mosaic meeting that we had. Um, and it's just a great resource for this, this article by um, Rabbi Steve Greenberg. Um, if you wanted to share it uh, you know, with anyone, or I'm using it with our, our teens at Am Shalom to do a Purim teen program on hiding and revealing identities from different perspectives, including the LGBTQ perspective. We're having our teens actually run it for other teens. So um, I just wanted to just share that article and, um, and thanks so much to Chris and to Corey for presenting and uh, the whole group. And um, we were, if we had time, going to talk about um, the, you know, the fact that we've had this offshoot group that's working on these uh, ideas for Passover. But if there's um, another group, you know, volunteers, if you're interested in um, saying, I'd love to work with other people on a Pride Shabbat or on fall, you know, a Sukkot LGBTQ theme for Westchester, whatever it is, um, you know, I, I did put my email there. If you're interested in, in um, doing something, we as a um, group are really happy to um, generate more ideas for our community to, um, you know, to just get the word out and, and say that we are uh, inclusive for everybody and we're really proud of our Jewish traditions that um, really have values that teach inclusivity too. So um, if you're interested in do, taking on an initiative, you can even explore an idea with me and then at the, an upcoming meeting, we can um, put it out there and see if there's other people. Cause this has been just such an incredible opportunity of this group of us, the, this offshoot from this round table to work together. And we really just 
we each give what we can give to the program. No one is like, oh my God, I, I, you're asking me to do things that I can't do. So it's really you, you know, create it based on what um, you're able to give to the project or initiative. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's I. This offshoot has just done such an amazing job, and we can't wait also until next year when we actually get to have that Passover, whatever we want to call it. Um, so, thank you, thank you all of you for coming this evening, for walking all the way to your computer from whatever room you are in. We all really appreciate it. Um, and it was great seeing you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Rabbi Goldberg. And that's all, folks. Hope you have a good night. Uh, can Thank I you. make a quick announcement? Very, sure, very quick Rachel. invitation for, for everyone. We have a few spots left. Uh, Rebecca Ruberg and uh, the Jewish Education Project and Hillel's of Westchester and a couple of other folks from the community are joining together for a nationally recognized curriculum on youth mental health first aid. Our time slot is February 17th from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. If you are a professional in Westchester who is working with youth, you are eligible to join us free of charge. It typically costs about $2,500 per person. So I will drop my email in the chat um, if you are interested in joining our group, uh, Rebecca can let you know how many, how many slots we have left and uh, please chime in if I missed anything, Rebecca. I'm just about to drop the actual link in the chat so that anybody who would like to uh, potentially register has the access to the event. Um, so if everyone can just hold off or hold up for one second, I will be um, sharing that as well. And I, I will note, while it's open to all Westchester um, professionals, it's also open to anyone who is a communal minded person. So if you um, have any touch point with a teenager, um, as a parent, as um, a lay leader, this is a really great opportunity to do this a training. Um, the one other piece I'll say, uh, having a little bit of like historical knowledge of it is that they revamped the curriculum over the summer. Um, and made it significantly more LGBTQ inclusive. That was my biggest criticism of the course previously. Um, and now the scenarios, everything has been adapted to be much more mindful, um, respectful <laughs> and inclusive. Um, so something that, uh, you know, as we recognize that our teens are um, particularly at risk and particularly LGBTQ teens are at risk, having adults in their lives that are able to be supportive and listen um, is really critical um, and having the right access to the right resources to be able to have the language for uh, should they share anything with you. Um, we will, this is a great opportunity to train and, uh, and to do so for free is a real, a real privilege. Thank you. Anyone else? I don't want to cut off anybody. If anybody needs to leave, that's fine. But if there's any other announcement anybody wants to make. All right, that's in that there now, so I won't we we won't cut that off you if you want to get that um, website there. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night, and we will see you soon. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Thank everybody. you so much. Thanks, Pam. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.